Innovation Officer for Ector County ISD. And between Ector County and Northwest ISD, we have a partnership where we can share um, different uh, experiences, presentations, projects. And this is one that we're bringing to you today. Uh, we're super excited. Um, Dr. Joy Reinberg is a dear friend of mine. We met quite a few years ago at Google in Mountain View, California, so Googleplex. And um, in more recent history, I had the privilege to go and help document a, um, an anatomy uh, circle on an uh, elephant seal that was attacked by a great white shark. So I thought it was really fascinating, so I was the one clicking the images. So I really think this would be a great opportunity for you to pick her brain as she shares with you some more in-depth anatomy, comparative anatomy between species, mythical species, and our own personal anatomy. So a warm welcome for Dr. Joy Reidenberg of Mount Carmel. I don't know if you heard Jason, but at least you can hear me. So I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry that I brought all the cold weather down with me from New York. I'm not used to seeing frost in Texas. I don't know if you guys are, but that really surprised me. Yeah, I, I was expecting it to be like, I give a talk, I have a little vacation, a little warm weather, but it looks like I'm going to have New York weather here, so I apologize if that was my fault. So I am going to talk to you about mythical animals, but I'm going to tie it in with anatomy as an anatomist would look at a mythical animal and help you to decide what's real, what's not real, what's based in reality and a little bit exaggerated, which is 90% of the cases. So most of what I'm going to use for our evidence is going to be bones. I'm going to make comparisons to bones. There's lots of other things that we can talk about in terms of anatomy. Anatomy is the structure of the body, and I teach anatomy to medical students. So most of the time I'm working with human anatomy, but my research is in comparative anatomy, looking at lots of different animals, and that gives me the background to evaluate some of these mythical animals, some of which are all animal, and some of which are half human, half animal. And I'm going to only look at the bony anatomy when it comes to the comparisons with humans, because otherwise you'll be here until next year if I try to teach you all the rest of the human anatomy in one session. So we're gonna limit it to that, and start off with a relatively local legend, uh, some of you may have even Mexican ancestry. So we are going to start with something that's very close to Texas, which is Mexico, and deal with a Mexican legend of the feathered serpent. Now I apologize that our screen sizes are not matching, so for some of these slides, the words on the bottom may disappear. So you'll just take my word for that that begins with an F that says feathered serpent, or the Quetzalcoatl. And this is a god that actually can go between the heavens and the earth. It has properties of birds and properties of land animals. It is a mixture of a snake and a bird. And not just any old snake and any old bird, but a very, very beautiful bird that has beautiful green iridescent feathers and a snake that's particularly dangerous that you're familiar with here called the rattlesnake. So this is one of the sculptures of this feathered serpent is this godly animal that can go between heaven and earth. And when we take a closer examination of what this animal is really made out of, it's made out of two very, very incredible animals. This bird has a very, very, very long tail. It's called a Quetzal bird. And the long tail shimmers and wiggles. They're very rare, these feathers today. I don't even have one I can bring and show you because we couldn't get any museums to loan them to us because they are so rare. They were used as currency by the Mexican uh, Indians. And so these feathers are actually very flexible. And as, they, as the bird flies, they, they wiggle. And as they wiggle, they reminded people of a snake because their motion was very S-like as it would move up and down as they would fly. And then there's the rattlesnake, something that I think some of you are familiar with. How many people here have seen a live rattlesnake? How many here have been bitten by a rattlesnake? Nobody? Wow, maybe one or two on hands in the back, but that's one. You've been bitten. Did you have to have anti venom? Yeah? So, rattlesnake venom is incredibly poisonous, or toxic, I should say. It's not poison, it's a venom. And so, if you get bitten by a rattlesnake, you could die unless you have anti venom. 
Now, I give a similar talk like this in West Texas, and a lot more people raise their hands. So I guess there are more rattlesnakes in West Texas than there must be up here. So the rattlesnake, I'm going to switch. I'm going to go back and forth between my computer and this document camera. Let's hope the connections work. I'm going to show you a close-up of this rattlesnake. So I need to put on gloves for this because this actually was a head taken off of a real rattlesnake. It still has venom in it. And I don't want to be the first person in the Guinness World Book of Records that's been bitten by a dead snake. <laughs> so, so if we look at this head, what we're, what we're seeing here, this is the, the neck part of the head. Can you see that? I'm going to zoom it in a little bit here. Okay, let's see if I can center that a little bit better. There should be a lamp that's on, right? Okay. So, there's the head of the snake. So this is the front of the snake here. This is the neck where it was cut off. And if I turn it like this, you're now looking at the belly part of the snake. So this is, these are the scales of the belly of the snake here. This is the lower jaw. And if I pull the lower jaw out of the way, I left the, this little coffee stirrer stick in here to show you where the, the fangs are. You see those two things that are overlying the wood? I'll point to it to make sure you'll see it. See this right there? This and this, these are the two fangs of the rattlesnake. So we're looking at the upper jaw. This is the upper jaw here. And these two fangs normally nest inside the roof of the mouth. So they're tucked in. So they're, they're mobile. They can move in and out. So when the snake wants to close its mouth, it doesn't sting itself, you know, with its venom. It tucks the teeth inside. But when it wants to bite, it pulls those teeth out. And that's what I'm trying to do here with this stir stick here. So I'm pulling these two fangs out. And the very ends are very sharp here and here. These are connected to a venom sac that actually constricts. It actually closes. There's muscle around it. constricts. And when it does, it pumps the venom through these teeth. So these teeth are actually hollow. They're like little hypodermic needles, little injection needles. And they pump the venom through the hollow teeth into their victim. So this is a particularly dangerous snake. And in the, uh, in the wilds, if you're outside sometimes, maybe even in your house, you might hear a rattlesnake. It has a very distinctive rattle. I have here two rattlesnake skins. I'm not going to unbundle them because I'm afraid I'm going to crack them because they're very dry. But at the end of one of them, here is a rattle. Everybody see that? It's probably a little too close. Let me, let me move out of the camera here. Okay. So we move our, our head up and out of the way here. I'll show you this rattle. There's the rattle. The rattle actually has inside of it little dried scales. So when you shake the rattle, I'm going to do it next to the microphone. You hear that sound, go the other way. <laughs> okay, so that was a terrifying sound because that meant in the old days, that meant death because there was no anti venom. You know, today it's not as quite as terrifying because you know you can get to a hospital and get some anti venom. But in the old days, if you heard that and you got bit, that was the end of your life. So that meant that this animal, this rattlesnake, was so important to the people of the time because it meant danger, it meant power. This was a god that had a lot of power and could kill you. But even more so, this is an animal that could shed its skin. And if you shed your skin, it's like being reborn again. So they'd see the skin of the rattlesnake and they'd think it's like a ghost. It even had eyes, right? Because there's actually a scale over the eyes to protect the eyes. And when they shed their skin, that scale comes off and it looks like there's an eye on the skin. And so the rattlesnake's skin, the shed skin, was a sign of leaving behind the old and the dead. And you have a shiny brand new snake that emerges from it as if it's been reborn. So the first born-again Christians, they were, they were rattlesnakes, okay? They got born again. And so this idea that you could die and be born again, only gods could do that. Gods had the immortality. So here was an animal that represented immortality and power, but it was very earthly. It was on the ground, sometimes even in holes in the ground. And then there was the bird, which represented going to heaven, something that could fly up to the heavens and had the ephemeral qualities of the beauty and grace, all mixed together to make a beautiful god. Now, one of the things that's really interesting about snakes, if you notice, snakes always move side to side. So their vertebra, or backbones, 
are quite constricted because they can only move side to side. I'm going to move some of these things out of the way to show you some vertebra. Just take some stuff down to the end of the table. Now I'm going to be walking back and forth a lot, so don't, don't get too dismayed if I keep disappearing from the podium. That's, that's all part of the plan. So I have on this table replica bones from a human skeleton. These are all plastic, they're not real. It's a little hard to bring the real ones into the airport. So <laughs> even though I legally can, as a professor in a medical school, we have the rights to, to carry and transport real bones. It's just not worth the hassle of bringing it into the airport. So I'm going to show you some replica bones, but they look just like the real ones. So these are the neck bones, and there are seven neck bones in a human. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Then we get to the chest bones. There are 12 of these. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Okay, so these are the, oops, not in your view, I'm sorry. Why do I have a split screen? Does anybody understand what's going on here? Look, so my hand that's at the top is at the bottom. Okay, that's kind of weird, but all right. Well, I don't know what's going on with the techie things here. I'm not a techie person, so uh, I will limit it to the top of the screen as best as I can, since I don't have the whole screen. But there are the bones of the chest region. We call these thoracic vertebrae. And then, these last five, one, two, three, four, five, here they are. So we can get them in view. One, two, three, four, and five. These bones down here are what we call the lumbar vertebra. They're in the lower back, where you have the sway back. Now, why am I showing you this after I just spoke about a snake? Because snakes can only move their bodies from side to side. Well, that's not exactly true. They mostly move their bodies from side to side. Some snakes have more flexibility curling forwards. And those would be the pythons and the boas, the ones they can constrict, because they have to wrap their bodies around animals to constrict. So they do so by bending their vertebra and pulling the spines, which are the part that stick out on the back, farther away from each other. So it's kind of like, like when I, oops, I get my fingers there. I spread my fingers like this, I'm spreading the spines away. So these spines over here would get spread apart in order to make an arc. So I did that here in the thoracic region. I, I made as much of an arc as I can, but in reality, go back down. Okay, so I made an arc here. But in reality, it's hard for us to arc that much, because that much arcing, remember, I'm only showing the bones, but in between each of these bones is also a disc. So there's a little cushion in between, and you start adding that to it, it makes it, uh, lots of flexibility to move, but you don't want to separate so much that the joints fall apart. So each bone is joined to the next one by what we call a synovial joint, which is a joint where there's lots of movement, lots of fluid. And we can bend, we can bend our, our back forward and back, but mostly in this area, we move it side to side like a snake does. So in our chest region, we're very good at twisting. Try it. You see, you twist from one side to the other. Just try not to hit the person next to you. Okay? And you're very good at twisting with that part of your body because the joints that come together are actually in an up and down plane. So they can slide across each other like this. And that's why you can bend side to side. You do some bending in your, your waist area, but most of it is actually happening in the upper chest region. The forward and back movement, you can do it with your chest bones, but not as well as you can with your lower back. So with your lower back, most of your bending is actually happening at your lower back. When you bow, you bow forward, it's actually happening mostly down here. And when you 
curve backward. Again, most of it's happening with the small of your back. So you can try doing that in your seat. You can see there's much more flexibility in the lower part of your back. That's the part snakes don't have. They don't have that flexibility to go forward and back like we do. They mostly do the side to side, unless they're a python, in which case they're simply separating the bones of that chest region. And why am I emphasizing the chest region? Because if you look at a snake skeleton, almost the entire skeleton is like the chest region. There's ribs down the entire body of the snake. We just have ribs in the chest region. I'm wearing some bones on here, you can see the ribs. The ribs are in the chest region, but in a snake they run all the way down the body. So they have a really, 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 really long chest. And they've packed their organs in such a way that they're basically stuffing them into a pipe. So instead of having two lungs side by side, they stagger them. You have one lung, then you have the other lung. Instead of two kidneys side by side, they stagger them. You have one kidney, then the other kidney. Everything is staggered, so they fit into a long, narrow tube. And they protect it with ribs. So almost everything is encased by ribs. There's only a small part of the snake that represents our lower back, part that can move forward and back. So we have much more ability to move forward and back, and that's really a mammalian trait. Think about how a snake moves. A snake is essentially a fish swimming on the land. Right? Fish swims with his body going side to side. <coughs> and the snake on the land is still going side to side. And if you look at lizards and you watch them run, even though they have legs, their bodies are still going side to side. Watch a crocodile or an alligator run, same thing, side to side. A lot of the side to side movement is essentially still a fish with legs swimming on the land. When you get to mammals, those legs go underneath the body. And as they lift the body off the ground, now you can do galloping motions, like horses do, and leaping motions, like cats do. And you can carry a pregnancy if you're female because there's room for the belly to expand now. But lifting the body off the ground meant you can cover a lot more territory with a lot less energy. And in order to do that, your spine has to now move up and down. So a mammalian trait, is for the spine to move up and down. So this up and down movement, very much what mammals do. That's why horses have that rolling motion when they're galloping. And then animals that went back into the ocean as mammals, like whales, like seals, and sea lions, and manatees, and dugongs, these animals have an up and down motion to their spine. So when you watch a whale swimming in the water, it is essentially galloping through the water, but without legs. But the spine is still going up and down, unlike a fish, where the spine is going side to side. Let's look at this region, this thoracic region, a little more carefully. What we notice is that on these bones are little divots. I'm not sure how well it's showing up here in the light, but you can see these little crunchy parts over here. That's where ribs attach. I'm going to grab a rib. And we'll just stick it here on our spine, Let's put it in view a little bit better. And when a rib attaches to a spine, we'll separate it off and just show you one. It attaches like this. So what it's doing is it's attaching to the body, and it's also attaching to this part that sticks out over here, called a transverse process. That's a transverse process. And these <laughs> both are movable joints. So the rib actually swings up and down, like the handles on a bucket. It swings up and down like this. So try to breathe in deep, and you'll feel your ribs go up. And then breathe out, and your ribs go down again. Try that, ribs going up, and then ribs going down. So they're actually quite movable. They accommodate for the changes in volumes of your lungs. So if you dive deep in the water, and the pressure around you gets higher and higher, it squishes the air in your lungs, and your ribs start collapsing down to accommodate for that change in volume. So the ribs are actually quite mobile. This transverse process that sticks out on the side, when you cut this vertebra down the middle, like that, and you separate it off to the side, this part that sticks out over here is the T in the T-bone steak. Right? You ever look, look, next time you get a T-bone steak, look carefully at the bone that's in the steak. And you're going to see a little hole, a little curved part here. That's where the spinal cord goes, but you only see half. And then here's the vertebral body, or backbone, that makes that chunky part of the T. Then you have this long stem, that's the transverse process. This part of the back here is called the spinous process. And you see how in, in humans, these all nest very close against each other. So they're, they're very nicely nested. So there's a limit to how much we can bend backwards. We can't bend backwards very much because each of these is hitting the next one. 
we can bend forwards if we want to separate them, like that. And that's what the python does when it tries to wrap around something. But it has a very hard time going backwards because of all the spinous processes, and so do we. That's why we need the lumbar vertebra. Then we move into our neck region. Here's our neck region. Okay, so there are seven neck vertebrae. What makes these distinctive is each one of these vertebra, oops, wait, this one's part of our thorax. Let's get back here. Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Here we go. Seven neck vertebrae here. And each one of these is distinctive because they have holes on either side. Doesn't matter which one you look at, you're going to see holes on either side. And these holes are for blood vessels that are running up to the brain to feed the brain. They're not the only blood vessels feeding to and from the brain. We also have the carotid artery, which is coming in the front here next to the jugular. But these are in the back. It's like a second blood supply, just in case, because the brain is that important. You have to have more than one blood supply to it. So this is the spare blood supply to the back of the brain. And all of these neck vertebrae have that. Now these neck vertebrae, they have joints, these synovial joints, that allow movement when you turn your head left and right. So try turning your head left and right. You feel it swiveling in there. So that left and right movement, again, snakes don't do that either. Neither do fish. That's a mammal thing. And all mammals have these seven neck vertebrae. These, these last few ones, these five, are look, they all look pretty similar. But the first two are a bit modified. So here are the first two. This first one nests right next to the skull. Let me get a skull. Here's a skull. I think we're going to have trouble putting this in here. Let's see, can we make this any? That is really weird how it split the screen like that. Okay, well, we'll do our best. Okay, so the back of the skull, which is barely in view, I'm going to put the head, the head is right side up to you right now. See, there's the lower jaw. There's the teeth, okay? So if you look at the back of the skull, right over here, this hole that I put my finger into is where the spinal cord comes out. And right next to it, here, oops, goes like this, is where this vertebra sits, nested right against the skull. Oh, yay, thank you, whoever did that. Okay, there we go. So this nests right against the base of the skull like that. This is the first vertebra, see that? It has these little, these little divots in here that are sort of like rocking chair bottoms here, little curves, and they fit right against these little curved projections that stick out of the skull on either side of the hole where the spinal cord is. And they allow movement rocking back and forth like this. Or I should move the head, really. So it's when you move your head up and down like you're, you're saying yes. That's that joint, saying yes. And the name of this vertebra is very interesting because this vertebra is essentially holding up a big globe. So there was a myth, mythical person from a long time ago in Greece who was said to hold up the world. Anyone know his name? Atlas. Atlas. So we named this vertebra Atlas because Atlas is essentially holding the world. And the skull looks like a big globe, looks like the world. And right underneath Atlas is this very special vertebra. See it right here? It has a big projection sticking out of it, like that. See that little projection right there? Okay, so that nests right against this. And now these two vertebra. Okay, Skull, so you have to move. Okay. These two vertebra, this Atlas can twist around that projection. So if I put it together again like that. He can rotate back and forth around it, just like that. So when you do the no movement, you put your head from left to right, most of that action is happening between Atlas and the next vertebra, whose name relates to the action it does. It has this thing sticking out, which forms a line, which we would call an axis. And the rotation is about that axis, so we name this vertebra axis. So Atlas and axis are the only vertebra that have names. Everything else has a boring identification, like cervical vertebra number two, or C2, or C3, or C4, and so on. But these are the only two that have real names. Now, I said that mammals have seven cervical vertebrae, but what about giraffes? How many vertebrae would be in the neck of a giraffe? Whoa! Seven. Seven! Seven vertebrae in the neck of a giraffe. Even though it's a really, really, really long neck, 
It still has seven because it's a mammal. How about whales? Seven. Whales look like they have a head and it goes right to a body. So how many neck bones would they have? One. Seven because they're mammals, but they're squished really tight together. So giraffes have really, really long neck bones and whales have really, really short neck bones, but all mammals have seven neck bones. Right? If you look at a fish, you get maybe one or two neck bones and immediately you've got those annoying bones that stick out, they have to take out of the fillets so you don't choke on them when you eat fish meat. <laughs> so they, they start immediately right from the head, they go right into the chest. And when you look at reptiles, they start to get a little bit more of a neck, but they don't reliably always have seven vertebrae, they can have more or less, depending on the, on the animal. But most animals go immediately, most reptiles go immediately into that chest, so a snake doesn't have very much neck, just enough to, to turn its head a little bit to look at you, and then the rest of it is chest. Okay. Let's go back to our presentation mode. Hello. And don't give me a split screen. Okay, I know I pressed the right button. Is there anything else I need to do to make it work? Give it one second. Give it a minute. Okay, it needs to think about it. All right, so while it's thinking about it, I'm going to put these both back. I'll leave, I'll leave this guy looking at you. There we go. All right, still thinking about it? Okay, so one of the things we're going to talk about, remember those spines I was telling you about on the dragon? Excuse me, on the, uh, on the human back, how they stick out? So dragons are thought to have really long spines sticking out on the back. So if you thought the spines were long on the back on the human, they're even longer when we get to an animal like a dragon. So the next time we're going to talk about is a dragon. So while they're figuring out how to do that, I'm going to show you some animals that might have inspired dragons. Let's start with something like this. Anybody know what this is? This is an alligator. Yes, it's a really big alligator. And if I lift it open, look at those teeth. I would not want to be caught between these two parts of the alligator. Because these teeth are pretty devastating. So if you see this and you think this inspires fear, it's even more disconcerting when you see an even bigger skull than this that has long dagger-like teeth that all basically have a cone shape. You think of an animal that has long dagger-like teeth that's even bigger than this? Crocodile. A shark, maybe? Oh, where's our shark tooth? I think that's still in one of the boxes. We're going to show a shark tooth as well. So, so a crocodile can be bigger than this, but will look very much like this. And a shark tooth, most shark teeth are not that big. But if you look at a fossil shark tooth, like a megalodon, they can be huge. They can be bigger than my hand. And these shark teeth, if you saw one of those and you didn't know anything about evolution, you dug this up as a fossil, you would think that belonged to a really big animal, and you'd be right. But you might not know what that animal was because the rest of the shark is not made of bone. It basically dissolves. So the only thing you usually find from a shark is its teeth. So if you saw that, you would recreate something like this, but with a much, much, much bigger head, because now we're talking about teeth the size of my hand coming out of here. All right, how many of you have ever been to a museum and seen dinosaur bones? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's bring that out. Thanks, guys. This is one of Jason's prize finds. You know, he's a paleontologist, and he, he goes diving in these really weird places and takes things out of the mud and finds stuff like this. Oh. This is a shark tooth from a megalodon. Okay? It's a really, really, really big shark tooth. And so if you saw something like this, you would think, wow, this dagger-like thing that's coming down, this could really hurt. This is... Well, that, they're still doing that. I'm just going to keep on talking. All right, so now, if you've been to a museum and you've seen an animal with even bigger teeth than this, what might you have seen? Megalodon. How about if you're in the dinosaur hall? A T-Rex, I heard someone say a T-Rex. Imagine you're you're some, you know, medieval person digging in the ground trying to, you know, plow your field and you come across a T-Rex skeleton. What are you gonna think about that? I mean, now we're talking about teeth like this, like the alligator's tooth, but maybe this big. So now we've taken this head and we made it bigger than this table. That's a really scary big animal. 
So if you've got an animal that's that big, you might think that was a dinosaur if you understood evolution. But people in the medieval times didn't understand evolution. They knew that what they found was real, it was a real bone. But what they found was a dinosaur, but they didn't know what dinosaurs were. So they recreated what they found. They put the bones together and they said, okay, here's the frame for it. What is it? You know, as many bones, they always find all the bones, so they made up the parts they could find. And then what they thought they were looking at was something like this. A dragon. And you can see how a dragon would be inspired. Thank you. I'm afraid now to switch back and forth. It's, it's going to be a... We'll try it one more time, and if it fails, we're not going to do the document camera. Okay? So, this is a, a beautiful picture of a dragon. I love it because I'm a New Yorker. This building that it's next to is every New Yorker's favorite building. It's not the most famous building in New York. This is not the Empire State Building, the one that Kate Conn hangs off of. This is even better. This is called the Chrysler Building, and it's a beautiful Art Deco building, so I'm so glad they picked that as one of the posters for Mythical Beasts. This is a, a show that's airing on Science Channel, that if you get cable and get Science Channel, you can watch some of our episodes of Mythical Beasts. Let me tell you a little bit about dragons. So dragons actually started off not as these giant creatures that we imagined that might have been inspired by T-Rex, but they were actually much more boring, much more humble. They were smaller animals, and they were mostly snakes. Now, I know you can't really see this one that's down here. A little bit it's cut off, but there's the head. See the little flame coming out of its mouth? There's its eye, and there's some coils that go around like this. That's a red snake on an almost red background, so it's hard to see. Here's a snake-like animal. It had a couple of feet, only two, which is kind of weird, right? Because lizards should have more than two, and I'll tell you why there were only two in a moment. But, but this is essentially a snake. And this one down here, I know, again, this is a little hard to see, but there's a snake. It's rising up over on this side. There's a snake over here. There's the coils of it. Here you can see one. Look at the snake over here. See that? It's basically a snake. Maybe that's a leg. We're not quite sure what's going on there, but it's essentially a small lizard or a snake. This one's definitely a snake. This one's kind of a snake, except they gave it two legs. I don't know what happened. But they gave it two legs. So essentially they were snakes. Well, maybe they were lizards, but they were mostly snakes. And the reason was because, and these are all, by the way, depictions of St. George, the famous story of St. George killing the dragon. It was actually St. George killing a snake. So it kind of takes it down a little bit until you realize that this is actually part of the Christian mythology because the snake was actually symbolic. The snake represented Satan. The snake represented evil. Why is Slytherin House in Hogwarts? Why did they have a snake? Supposed to be evil, right? By the way, I told all my medical students they're in Slytherin House. Why? Because what's the symbol of a medic? The double snakes, right? The double snakes on the staff. That's, you know, every medic has to be in Slytherin House, right? Okay, so the snake was the animal that gave the apple to Eve and started the original sin. So Christians associated the snake with evil and Satan. So if you killed the snake, you killed evil, you killed Satan. And that is really what the whole St. George story was about because he was all about converting people to Christianity. But as the storytelling progressed, the snake changed. And it became more lizard-like. So as we move forward in time from those original uh, old manuscripts, we start getting snakes with more legs. So we went from two legs to four legs. Now that's a lot more like a lizard if you've got four legs. Here's something that looks like a pretty substantial lizard. This is very, you know, alligator looking to me. Or something like that, except it's standing with its back a little bit higher than an alligator. Here's another one with four legs. Here's one standing up on two legs and putting the other two legs behind it like this to try and get tall. So it's kind of like an alligator standing up. Here's another one, it almost looks like a lion, but with a very smooth body. So they had lots of fantasies about what these animals really were, but they seemed to be morphing into lizards. And we wonder, could this really be real? What did they really think this animal was? Well, there are two animals in the animal kingdom that could really have inspired this mythology. One is the anaconda. This is a giant snake. By the way, this is, you guys have cattle around here, you know how big they are. Okay, this is a pregnant cow. And this snake is trying to kill this cow by constricting around it. Here's the head of the snake. There's the tail of the snake. Look at the mid part of the snake. It's much bigger than my thigh. This is a large snake. And this snake doesn't kill the animal by suffocating it, by the way, in case you're wondering. 
These snakes kill the animal by constricting the chest so much that the heart can't beat anymore. That's how they actually kill their prey. They squeeze it so tight that the heart stops beating. Then the animal dies, and since it's not struggling, now they can try and swallow it. So imagine this snake could actually eat an animal of that size because it can actually open up its jaws really wide and engulf that entire animal. So this, this is a pretty impressive looking uh, animal when you see something that size. But here's the lizard version of it, right? So if you add legs to a snake, you get a lizard. So here is that lizard that looks very much like the one that St. George was, was trying to fight. Let's just go back. Looks a lot like this one down here. So what was, what was he looking at? He might have been inspired by, or the artist may have been inspired by seeing a Komodo dragon. They're actually called dragons because they reminded everyone so much of the dragons in the paintings of St. George. This is, is one of the, or probably is the biggest lizard in the world. And it's trying to eat a goat over here. So it has actually some, some toxins in its saliva, so if it bites the animal, and it just waits, the animal eventually fall down and die, and then it will consume that animal. So this is what this lizard is doing. That's a pretty dangerous looking animal. If you can eat something the size of a goat, it can certainly eat a person. So that was danger. So yes, they could be real. But when we think about dragons, we think about things with wings. So where could the wings have come from? Well, I love this old drawing of a snake. This was the original drawing of a dragon, an old drawing of a snake with wings, but the wings were, they weren't very bat-like, they were very crumply. They looked like, you know, a bad umbrella after a good windstorm. So, so this, is, this is what they thought were wings, and if you look carefully, this looks a lot like this all folded up. This is a, a lizard that's called a frilled dragon. Why is it called a dragon? Because when it erects these frills here, it opens them up fully. Here it's starting to open, here it's full. It's like opening up an umbrella. And this looked like wings right behind the head. Look, it even has these little rays in it, kind of like bat wings do. The bat wings have little fingers in it to help open the, open the bat wings. These have little, little support structures inside, like the ribs on an umbrella. And that was thought to be the inspiration for wings on dragons. But this is not a very big lizard. Like, you could step on this and kill it. Okay? <laughs> this is a little guy. So. If someone told you about this, you might think, oh, those dragons, they had wings. But how did we end up with the giant European dragon that we think of? Well, it was a lot of storytelling put together. People talked about the different parts, and everybody described a different part. They pushed it all together into one hey, crazy combination. So you got an animal that looks like it's got the body of a lion. Remember, one of those animals up there looked kind of like a lion with blue skin. It's got the tail of a snake. It's got the head of some kind of sea animal, like a sea serpent with these little spines. It's got a lion-like head with teeth like an alligator, flames coming out of the mouth. Crazy nose going on here. I don't know what's up with that. And then here are these wings with the umbrella ribs in them. So they put this all together and said, there's a dragon. It's just this chimera of lots of things all mixed together. We got a lot of music going on here. That must be the, the signal you're supposed to go to class, except you don't have to, right? So what inspired the really big dragons that we think about, the big European dragons, the giant-sized things, the flying ones? Probably it was fossil bones, as I was starting to say before I got this thing working. So if you look at the fossil bones, and you put these together, you can imagine how people thought that these lizards were enormous in size, and they were. They just didn't know the name dinosaur because they didn't understand about evolution. They thought these were real animals that existed in the moment. At the time, they were just dead and buried in the ground. And there surely were more of them out there. So if you take all these dinosaur bones and you put them together and reconstruct it, you're starting to build essentially a dragon body. It's got the long neck and the long tail and the four legs. This is very much what you would expect on a dragon. You know, just the base, the base model of a dragon, right? The really big lizard. This is some kind of sauropod, brontosaurus type animal with a long neck and a long tail. But there's more than just a long neck and a long tail, right? They have, to have to have those sharp claws and the sharp teeth that we spoke about. So I already showed you the teeth. And if, uh, if you had been, I'm afraid to go back to the document camera, so I'm not gonna do it just yet. But I will show it to you from here, and if the document camera works, I'll bring it back again. But this is a skull from a python. And the python, I don't know if you can see that against the, the background, has very long, sharp teeth. I will show it here later. If you knew what a python was, 
and then you wrap it up to something this size, like a T-Rex. This is, this is, these are T-Rex teeth, they're huge, okay? That's essentially a really, really, really big python. So if a python can eat a cow, then T-Rex can eat just about anything, because its mouth is enormous. And then what about claws? Look at the size of those claws. If you look at a human hand skeleton, it just looks like this. You see, that's, that's a human hand. We don't have long claws, we have nails, little nails that come off here, not very impressive. Maybe you got paste on nails that are bigger or impressive, but that's, that's about it, right? Human claws are really not gonna, you know, tear up the world. What if you had a claw like this? Oh, now we're talking another story. So if you find something like this in the ground, okay, this is going to kill you. This is like something that pierces you, like a dagger. This is the claw, just the end, the very end of the toe of a dinosaur, of a big raptor, okay? And you can use this to tear open the flesh. So it didn't attack with its mouth, it attacked with its feet, and it ripped open its victim. So if you saw something like this, you'd be very inspired. What about those spines on the back? Remember the spines I showed you on the human vertebra? Now, you look at some of these dinosaurs, and you start seeing long spines coming off of the back. Look at these long things on the Spinosaurus. It's like a relative of the Stegosaurus. It has the plates that turn into long spines. Look at these spines. Look at these spines. And suddenly now we have a dragon with long neck, long tail, sharp teeth, claws, and dorsal spines. And then the wings. Where do the wings come from? You've heard of pterodactyls? Yes? The winged dinosaurs? They have a bat-like wing. Well, these are pterodactyls or pterosaurs these winged animals, they fold up their wings kind of like bats do, and then they open them up and glide with them, these long, membranous wings. So when they saw these wing bones, not all the dinosaurs had wing bones, but they didn't know which bones went to which dinosaur. And sometimes things were all jumbled together. So they reconstructed this dinosaur with wings. But what about the fire breathing? How did that get to be part of the mythology? Well. The idea was that these animals lived on the tops of mountains, in caves. And once in a while they would come out and raid the village. And when they raided the village, it's usually because they were angry because someone stole the gold, because these animals were apparently guarding gold over the mountains in those caves. If you went into the caves of the mountains, you might find some gold. Maybe there was some, you know, it's like coal miners would go in and they might find some other kind of mineral in there. Well, these caves might lead to an area where there was mineral deposits. So they surely knew these were being guarded by dragons. But on the tops of mountains is where storms would often gather and lightning strikes would start. And so fire would start at the top of the mountain. And the fire would then progress down the mountain into the village and it would burn the entire village. Because these villages were very fragile. They had straw roofs and wood frames. So all of that would ignite. They weren't made out of brick or stone or anything durable. They were made out of you know, these flimsy materials that easily ignited and if one house ignited, Everything down the block would ignite because the flames would leap from one to the next and they're very close together. So a dragon could easily destroy an entire village with its anger. But in reality, it was probably storms at the top of the mountain with lightning strikes that started all of that. So that was part of the mythology of the fire. But it continued when you look carefully at their smaller cousins, so to speak, because they thought dragons were the big ones and then the smaller ones were the everyday lizards and snakes. And if you look at a lizard or a snake, it has a forked tongue. See this tongue that sticks out here? It's forked. Anyone know why it's forked? Way in the back. Why is it forked? He's exactly right. I don't know if you can hear. I can hear him from here, so maybe you heard it. But I'm going to repeat it for those who said it, so thank you. or lizard, smells the air. They use their sense of taste on their tongue to taste the air. And they take that forked tongue and they bring it inside and they stuff it into their nose and they deposit that scent and then it's magnified a little bit more. And what they're trying to do is compare what's on the right fork versus the left fork. And whichever one is stronger, it tells it which way it needs to travel to get to its prey. So it's a way of comparing left and right sides. That's why the tongue is forked. But when it flicks in and out of the mouth really quick, it looks like a flame. I'm gonna show you that. This is a little video taken behind scenes 
when we were not filming for the series, we were just sort of playing around, trying to see if we could calm this snake down so we could get good video footage. So here, you're going to see the snake. It's a little bit hyper because it got a little bit warm and it decided to move. But I have a little video footage of it that was sort of taken on the, on the side with just a little iPhone. Don't worry about any of the sound. It doesn't matter. Just watch the head of the snake. The snake will not stay still. And you will see the tongue flicking in and out from its mouth. Come on, stay still, snake. It won't stay still. But there it is. There's the tongue. See, it's, it's trying to taste the air around me to see whether I'm worth eating. <laughs> it clearly likes it because it keeps trying to crawl around my neck and my chest. And it's like, okay, I want to try it and wrap you around so I can kill you. <laughs> but it was actually quite a nice thing most of the time. But it, was, it wouldn't stay still. But you can see that tongue going in and out and flicking. And it goes so fast, you really can't see that it's a tongue with four dents. It just looks like a flame lapping it out. So when people originally drew pictures of these snakes, they drew it with the red tongue sticking out, and it looked like a flame coming out of the mouth. People who've never seen the snakes and only saw the pictures assumed that that red thing coming out of the mouth was fire. And word spread as people looked at these pictures, because most people in medieval times couldn't read. They just relied on the pictures. And if they looked at this picture in this book of animals, which is called a beast here, it's like a, a diary or a, a dictionary or an encyclopedia of animals, there were pictures of all the different animals that were known at the time. Not all of them were real, because some of them were from stories. And the snake was shown with this fire coming out of its mouth, and that was the depiction of a dragon. But Asian dragons are a whole other story. Asian dragons did not represent evil or Satan or fires on the mountain. Asian dragons brought rain, and they represented luck and prosperity and goodness. And they were messengers from heaven. They, they floated up and down. They didn't even have wings. They could just levitate. And these dragons were essentially snakes. So we're going back to our first medieval views of dragons as snakes. These were also snakes, but they had legs. Now, like the medieval ones, the medieval ones had two legs sometimes. <laughs> The Asian ones usually had four legs, so they were truly reptiles, but had a very snake-like body. But what would inspire them to think of snakes with legs? Or even the medieval ones that thought of snakes with only two legs, right? So you get an animal like this, Mushu. How many of you have seen Milan? <laughs> okay, so some of you would know who Mushu is. He's a typical Asian dragon. He basically slithers around like a snake, but he's got legs. So here, of course, he's shown, you know, animated standing up. But most of the time, he would be running on the ground. So a snake-like body with legs is actually inspired by looking at animals like pythons and constrictors because the males actually have what are called spurs. There are two legs that stick out with points. Little hooks, can you see? See this little triangular thing here? This is like a claw. And here's another one over here. This is like a claw. And attached to these two things is the rest of the leg, but it's inside the body. So here's the skeleton of the snake, and here's the claw, and here's this long bone next to the claw. That long bone next to the claw is actually the rest of the, the lower extremity of a snake. It is essentially this bone. What is this bone? This is a thigh bone. A femur, very good. A femur or thigh bone. So in the snake, you've got a thigh bone, and attached to the very end of the thigh bone, it's just a toe, one toe like this. So this is essentially what you see on a snake. A thigh bone with a one toe. All the rest of the stuff is absorbed into little tiny nodules of bones at the base. And essentially, they're using this for grasping. So the males use this to grasp onto the female. Why? Because they don't have arms. So it's a little hard to stay connected, you know? So they use these little hooks to you know, hang on. So the males actually stick the hooks out, the females don't. But when you open them up, you see that there's really legs in there. What does this tell us? It tells us that in the past, this animal's ancestor had legs, which means during evolution, the morphology changed from fish-like to lizard-like with legs. And then the legs resorbed, and snakes are actually even more derived than lizards are because they resorb their extremities with just this little remnant that sticks out. And that could be what inspired the legs, two legs on the medieval snake dragons, and then four legs on the Asian dragons, because there were legs here. OK, here's a four-legged beast. This is called a griffin. And what could have inspired a griffin? 
So if you've seen Harry Potter, you may have met the Hippogriff. And if you've read uh, Through the Looking Glass of Alice in Wonderland, Lewis Carroll has a depiction here of a griffin. This is the griffin, a lion body with an eagle head, eagle claws, eagle wings, but the back end is a lion. And in the Hippogriff, same idea except the back end is a horse. So these two animals, the front end was inspired by an eagle-like animal, and the back end, some kind of four-legged beast. And the story is that these giant birds with ears, claws, wings, and a lion or a horse body guarded gold in the desert. Not this desert, not Texas. In deserts in Mongolia. And so these are colder deserts. And in these deserts, they found lots of gold. But people who went to go find the gold were always a little bit leery of these giant animals that might come and attack them because they were, they were guarding the gold. And if you dug around into the ground, you'd see some of the remains of their bones as proof that they really did exist and they could be just around the corner. If you didn't look up carefully, you know, right behind a little rock, there might be a griffin waiting for you to pounce on you and kill you. What were the bones that they found in the desert? They found these bones of the protoceratops. And if you look at a protoceratops head, here's a protoceratops head. It has an eagle-like beak. There it is, the eagle-like beak, but it still has four legs and a tail. So it's starting to look a lot like this reconstruction over here, except this has ears and it has wings, so we don't see that right away. But if you look more carefully at the protoceratops skull, there's that beautiful eagle beak. See that over here? And then it has this fringe on the back. But this is just a sand that they didn't clean out here and here. Let's look at one where they cleared it out a little bit. It looks more like that. So they just had a membrane over it, but they didn't actually have bone in here. And sometimes this part in the middle might break, like on this skull over here. Here it broke. Which mean, would mean that this part is very fragile. So if they found a skull where that broke, let's say that broke, this is what they would see. That's pretty devilish looking. That is a scary looking thing. It looks like it's got horns over here. This eagle beak, these frowning eyes, these big horns, that's what they drew. Eagle beak, frowning eyes, big horns or ears sticking up over here. This was inspired by a fossil dinosaur called Protoceratops. But it's not the only animal that could have inspired it. Let me, let me go back for one second. There's another animal that could have also inspired it. It didn't actually come from the desert, but people who were traveling and came back across the Mediterranean Sea might have picked up some bones along the edge of the sea that they saw. And this came from, you know, a similar land was far away. And what they saw was something like this. Anyone have an idea what this might be? An alligator. It's not an alligator. There's no teeth in this. I heard someone in the front say it. Turtle, this is a sea turtle. This is a sea turtle. And look at the beak on this sea turtle. You see it? It's got a sharp beak in the front over here. And in the bottom as well. There's that sharp beak. So this looks very eagle-like. So if they saw something like this, and these can get pretty big, as you see, they would think, surely these were real. They might even see it with flesh on it and think, hey, this animal isn't just some old bone that was in the desert. Look, they're still alive. We found one, it still smells, it's rotting, whatever. They knew it was real. This had to be real. So these sea turtles may have also inspired the griffin myth. <coughs> but what about the rest of the griffin's body? <coughs> Excuse me. It had four legs, and if you look very carefully at those legs in the front, you would see little claws. Not as, not as big as this claw, but they were still, they still had claws. And so those claws inspired them to think that these, they didn't realize it was webbing in here. They thought each of these was a separate toe, and therefore this was kind of like an eagle's claw. And they imagined them as eagle claws, like a grab. And then there's a swelling on this tail. Look at, look at this part of the tail, how it swells over here. They really didn't know what to make out of that, but they definitely put a swelling in the middle of the tail. To accommodate that. So it's like a lion tail, but with this weird bulge in the middle of it. So that's very griffin-like. And then, what about the wings? Well, if you look at the shoulder blades of Protoceratops, they're very odd-looking. They're very long, and they kind of remind you of that little flat bone that sits against the turkey carcass, or chicken carcass, that helps support the wing. So they thought that these were wings. These are actually shoulder blades, but they're very bird-like in their shape. So they assumed that this supported a wing. And they reconstructed these animals with wings based on that. 
So this is probably where the Griffin story comes from. What does a shoulder blade look like on us? It's completely different from that. Here's a shoulder blade from a human. And the word shoulder blade is actually scapula, when you say the, the formal name, scapula. And a scapula means a shovel. And it looks kind of like a spade you would put in the ground and dig with. But this actually sits on the back, just like this. Kind of like little angel wings, right? If you imagine these two on my back, it's angel wings, like that. So these angel wings are attached to an arm bone. There's an arm bone. These, these arm bones are called a humerus. So if I pick up this arm bone, let's put the scapula next to it, it would connect like this. Everybody see this? I'm afraid to go to the document camera right now, but this is big enough. I think you can all see it. And you see how this rolls around in a ball and socket joint like that? So this means that we have a lot of flexibility in our shoulder. We can move our arm in pretty much any direction we want to. But the top part of the shoulder blade, right over here, this top part that sticks out is called the acromion, which derives from the word acropolis, meaning the high point. It's the high point on the shoulder blade. So that acromion, when it sticks out, is actually helping to stabilize the bone socket joint. So as, as you're rolling this around in this space here, it doesn't pop out. So it's got all these ligaments around it that hold it in place. Ligaments are little connective tissue strips that hold the, the joints together. If you have loose ligaments, you might be able to disarticulate a joint. You know, if you ever heard of someone's double jointed, they don't have two joints, they have loose ligaments. And they can do things like, like take their thumb and bend it backwards against their body. So that would be, that's not double jointed, which means their, their joint is so loose they pop it out of position. So, if you try to move your, your humerus, this is the humerus, up like this, you actually bump into this acropolis, right? Acromion, the acropolis. So if you try to lift your arm up, right, it seems easy to do, right, when you raise your hand and ask a question, try doing it by grabbing the acromion. So grab your shoulder here, and hold it tight, and don't hit your neighbor now, and try to lift your arm up as high as you can go. Don't let go of your shoulder. There's a restriction on how high you can go until you let go, you go up. If your arm is going up while you're holding it, you're really not holding the chromium. You're just holding the skin. Hold that bone, and you will only be able to go this far until you pop that bone out of position. And then you can move your arm up, because you've now destabilized your shoulder to reach all the way up. Because remember, this evolved originally for, for walking and holding weight, but we don't use it that way anymore. We've changed it. By the way, why is this called the humerus? Because it's funny? Because it has a funny bone on it? Oh, yeah. So it, the word humerus has to do with the word for shoulder. The humerus is the shoulder. But if you take this humerus and you connect it to the next bone below it, okay, that's the right one? It's this one here, okay. It actually has a nice joint where it swings back and forth like this. That's your elbow joint. Okay, see that? This is essentially a seesaw. Here's the fulcrum, the bottom. Here's the little seesaw. But it's sort of missing the lever arm. So imagine if it had a long part sticking out here, it'd be very easy to pull on this and lift it out. But we don't have a very strong elbow joint because we don't have a long lever arm on it. Animals that run on force have a much longer process here. And so when they pull on it, they really get a lot of power as they move their, their arm back and forth because they have a long lever arm. The equivalent in us is actually in the heel. So if we look at our foot, here's a foot. This part over here is much more sticking out compared to that. So if we put this at the bottom, like this, right? Wait, I'm sorry, it's this one. There we go, that's better. And we pull on this long lever arm right here. This is much stronger, much longer. Make it like a seesaw, okay? So we're putting it like seesaw. Here it is, the fulcrum. Here's the seesaw going up and down. This is a much bigger handle. We can pull on this really well. We've got a big calf muscle attached to Achilles tendon that goes into the heel and pulls on this. And that gives us much more power compared to what we have on our elbow. That's why it's much harder to do a push-up 
compared to just bouncing on your toes. I can bounce on my toes. Don't ask me to do the push-up. Can't do it. But I can bounce on my toes because I have a nice lever arm here. It doesn't take a lot of muscle energy. By the way, the tendon that attaches here is called the Achilles tendon. Do you know the story of Achilles? Why was Achilles immortal? Yes, he was dipped in the river Styx, except that his mother held him by the heel. So that's the one part of him that was vulnerable. And an arrow hit him here, and he died. Do you think someone could die from an arrow just hitting your heel? No. What really happened? Well, if that arrow severed this Achilles tendon, he wouldn't be able to run away very easily, which means other soldiers would kill him. Or the arrow could have hit a major blood vessel that's back here, and it could have bled out. Or my favorite theory is get a big wound here from the arrow. And remember, these guys are running around in sandals, and there's lots of horses, and horses leave behind a lot of presents. And if you step in one of those presents, you can get an infection. And therefore, he might have gotten an infection on his heel because he had an open wound right down there on the ground where all the horse remains were, were being deposited. Okay, so that's the story of, of that. Let's, let's move on to some other bones and other stories. Here's the Loch Ness Monster. Ah, Loch Ness Monster. Lots of people think they've seen the Loch Ness Monster. I believe everyone who says they've seen it has seen something. I don't believe that they saw this. This is a plesiosaur. And if you look at, at the pictures that have been put forward of Loch Ness Monster, a lot of them turned out to be hoaxes. This is the very famous surgeon's picture of the Loch Ness Monster. And if you look carefully at the head of this animal, see that head over here, and there's the back, and you compare it to the size of these little waves, remember this is not the ocean, this is a lake. These are little wavelets near the shore. So this was actually a very small thing. It wasn't a giant thing. Maybe it was a swan. Maybe. I don't think so, but maybe. Maybe it was an elephant. I don't think so. <laughs> not, in, not in Scotland. More likely it was some plastic dinosaur. And later on, the person who took this photograph, after he had a good time with the joke, finally admitted it was a hoax. It was a plastic dinosaur. But that didn't stop the mythology from spreading. Lots of people were then influenced by this, and when they saw objects, they believed that what they saw fit the bill for the description that was given of the Loch Ness Monster. And a lot of people said they were seeing plesiosaur dinosaurs. And this is the head of a plesiosaur. You see this dinosaur head with lots of teeth. And they saw things like this and said, that is this. It looks very similar, doesn't it? Except this is the head of a pike a freshwater fish. This is not a dinosaur head. If you open it up, the teeth are different. The skull falls apart to lots of pieces. It's not one solid piece like that. It doesn't have any of the same muscle attachments. It's a fish, but it has a similar shape because these two animals basically preyed in the same way, you know, lunging at smaller fish in between the rocks. So they had to have an arrowhead-shaped face to fit into those little spaces. And then there were things like this that washed up ashore. This shore looks like a plesiosaur. Look at that head. That looks like this. It's got a neck and a back and a tail, and one very big flipper over here that looks kind of like this big flipper over here. But in fact, this turned out to be a basking shark. Now a basking shark is a big plankton-eating shark, and when they die and they rot, the lower jaw and the gills basically fall off of the shark first. So what you're left with is a little teeny tiny head, because they have little tiny brains, so just the little brain case here and the rest of the backbone, and the flippers, which have very strong cartilage bars in it, they usually stay. So you see the big flippers still, but everything else is rotted away. And this has given rise to a lot of sea serpent mythology of things that look like plesiosaur. But it's a saltwater thing, so that wouldn't be in Loch Ness, the lake in Scotland. So let's take a look at the plesiosaur idea. Could a plesiosaur really been trapped in that lake all this time? And everybody with their iPhones and other smartphones will never capture a picture of it? It's a little hard to imagine. However, Let's take a look at whether a plesiosaur really could lift its head up like that in that swan-like pose. Remember what we were talking about with the spines on the human? How restricted we are in bringing our back backwards this way? Well, their neck was a lot like our back. It has a lot of these little spines sticking up like this. And if you look at these spines, these spines is a close-up of this. Here's a plesiosaur, here's the reconstruction. And it's shown with its head facing down because they basically swam around like giant turtles and reached their long neck down in between the rocks to grab fish. But when they wanted to lift their head up, they just needed a gentle raise of their head up 
in order to bring their nostrils to the surface of the water because they are actually air-breathing reptiles. They're not fish. They have to breathe air. But they don't need to raise their head high above the water because why, why do that? Their prey is under the water. But could they do it? The answer is no. These spines are too close together. Look at these two over here. Look at these two over here. Look at these guys over here. They're already touching. And if it lifted it up, it could close these smaller gaps in between here, but only until it basically got straight, maybe a little bit up, but not much. It definitely couldn't do the swan neck pose. So if there was a plesiosaur, it certainly wasn't looking like the, the surgeon's photo. So other reconstructions of the Loch Ness Monster show it as a snake-like animal, which brings to mind the idea of sea serpents. And people who lived around the loch weren't too far from the ocean. They were used to seeing what they thought were sea serpents in the ocean. They never went out to see. They didn't really understand those animals. What they were seeing in the ocean could have been things that washed up on the shore that were long and snake-like, like the oarfish. Oarfish is a deep-sea fish, but we know it only from carcasses that have washed ashore. This is the carcass of a dolphin that washed ashore. It has a long tail, and it doesn't have any hind legs. The flippers fell off already, and here's the head of it with the you know, beak-like thing that looks kind of like this, okay, same kind of shape. So a dead dolphin carcass could have been mistaken for a Loch Ness Monster, or several whales whose backs were arching. If they saw it from the highlands looking out at the ocean, and Loch Ness is only 10 miles from the ocean, it's not far. Uh, they may have seen backs of whales, and if you see lots of backs of whales, it kind of looks like the arcing of the back that you would see of a sea serpent. And many whales were mistaken for sea serpents when they were in a pod of whales together. They thought this was one long snaking animal. But whales would never be in the lake. They just assumed what they saw at sea was the same thing they were seeing in the lake. More likely, they might have seen something like this. This is a sturgeon. A sturgeon is a reptile like fish, okay? So it looks like the reptile, but it's not. It's actually a fish. It has scales on it that are very big, armor-plated, so it seems like a reptile, so they thought maybe this could be the plesiosaur-type animal, but it's really a fish. It's not going to snake up and down. It's only going to swim side to side, so it doesn't explain everything, although it is large and reptilian-looking. Here's a fish. You can't see its face. It's off the end here, but this is an eel. So freshwater eel fits the bill, looks very much like the snake-like monster. Same thing with the lamprey, another snake-like uh, fish that lives in the water. But these animals are too small to be the Loch Ness Monster. Well, it could be weird waves, which sometimes set up with the wind currents on the lake. That people see waves and they imagine things are making the waves or even in the waves. Could be a hoax. This is actually a Photoshop hoax to look like a baby plesiosaur. This is, a, this is a stick. Here's the guy holding it. If you crop the photo, gosh, it looks a lot like the surgeon's photo, doesn't it? It's just a stick. Here's some more sticks. That's a, that's a log with a very interesting looking open mouth. That's just a stick. Here's one with the same swan neck. Look at that, the same swan neck. It's actually a piece of this log over here. Here's a what looks like a snake in the water, but this is actually another twisted log or a piece of you know, driftwood that was floating around. But this is a piece of wood. And you can see how, from a distance, when you see pieces of wood or logs in the area, you might mistake that for a sea dragon of some sort. But what about this? What if I told you this was a verified, not Photoshopped, real photo taken recently on Loch Ness? And this is all true. This is a real photo, really taken at Loch Ness has not been digitally manipulated. It's been checked for, for its accuracy. It's not been digitally manipulated. This is what was being passed around as the truth of the Loch Ness Monster. But if you look very carefully at this snaking animal, and if you know a little two or three things about marine life, you will realize this is not one long snaking animal. These are three seals. Look, there's the head of seal. Here it is, here's the head of the seal. Here's its back. This is another seal. This is another seal. So we've got seals that occasionally run up the rivers that connect the sea to the lake, chasing salmon. They eventually get into the lake, but they don't stay very long because the lake doesn't have very many fish in it. So they might be seen there occasionally and then leave, which would explain these erratic sightings of Loch Ness. Here, here's a seal's head, here's its back. There's another one looking at you. These, these are pictures that I took of the same species of seal. I took these 10 miles away in the Moray Firth. This was taken in Loch Ness. 
These same seals went from the Moray Firth into Loch Ness and looked like the Loch Ness Monster. Even this back of the seal that I took here, see that? Or this one over here with a little flipper sticking up, this looks a lot like that. This is probably what underlies the Loch Ness Monster sightings. Let's talk at a, look at another underwater animal, mermaids. So mermaids, these are fun animals, right? These are half human, half fish animals. Well, mermaids, the stories go way back even, even before the Nuremberg Bible. This is an illustration that shows a mermaid, a merman, and a mer dog. What's a mer dog? A seal or a sea lion is essentially a dog mermaid, right? So, so we knew that seals and sea lions didn't have to get on the ark because they could swim around. They were real. If mer dogs were real, certainly mermen and mer women would be real as well. So the original inspiration for these mermaids could have been sea cows. Sea cows are manatees and dugongs. They have a fish-like body, or a whale tail, or a paddle tail. But otherwise, a streamlined body and a face. Not a beautiful woman's face. I mean, if you saw this, you were at sea a little too long if you thought it was a beautiful woman. Or maybe you were drunk if you thought that was a beautiful woman. Both of which are probably true of most sailors. So we've got this, this, this beautiful face looking at you, and what you don't see nested in here under the flippers right here is a nipple, because they actually have breasts on their chest. Here's a manatee that's nursing its baby from one of those nipples. So there are very few animals that have chest breasts, and that's one of the features of mermaids is they have the exposed chest, right? So if you look at the world, there are only three groups of animals that have chest breasts. Primates, which includes humans and other apes, and monkeys have chest breasts, elephants have chest breasts, and sea cows. And that's it. Everybody else has their breasts somewhere else. They even have a row of breasts like pigs do, or cats do, or dogs do, or they have hind breasts like cows do, or horses do. So they saw these animals nursing their babies with chest breasts, with a fish tail, told the story to others who then drew mermaids. But maybe the inspiration was also from seals. Because when a seal pops its head out of the water, it looks a little bit human-like. It's got these big eyes that look at you, very round head. Here's a seal, a small one. There were stories of selkies, which were essentially seal mermaids. These, are, these were women that shed their seal skin and then became human. But if they put their seal skin on, they became a seal again. What these probably were were Eskimo women that had come across from Greenland over to Scotland, took off their, their outer clothing, which kept them warm, and it looked like they were shedding their seal skin because their outer clothing was made out of seal skin. But if you saw these heads pop out of the water from a distance, you might think that they were women. Look, there's a nice round head. There's nice two, two beautiful eyes looking at you. There's another one with the head a little higher out of the water. Here's another one down here. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, a little, a little rum, a little seasickness. You look out, and sure, it's a woman, right? But remember how round the human head is. Here's a seal head. It's pretty round in the back. I don't have a model of that seal here to show you that has the round head. I've got a, a relative of it that comes from the Antarctic. Let's see, do we have that out here? Yes, here it is. This is a different kind of seal. Its head is more elongated, but the back of it right here is very round. So it has this very round globular part. So if it's looking straight at you, you can see the roundness of the head here sticking out of the water. Of course, if it opened these teeth, you'd be a little more scared, right? So as long as it had its snout pointing straight at you, you might not notice the teeth. You would notice the round head and think that looks a lot like a human head. <coughs> and this is probably also contributing to the mermaid story because there really were pathologies of humans who were born with their legs fused. So if that happened, then surely mermaids really did exist. So these are real human babies. I know it's a little hard to see because the bottom of the screen is cut off, but the legs are fused. And here are the toes. Here are the toes. This looks like a tail. These are, these are feet. These are feet over here. These are feet. These are legs. So these, these babies could have surgery to open up you know, these legs and turn them into normal walking people if they don't have too many other abnormalities going on. But they certainly looked like they were mermaids. And that's actually called mermaid syndrome. What about cyclops? Here's another mythology. 
The Cyclops was a giant human with one eye. If you look at a human skull, clearly you can see there are two eye sockets. So what they were seeing as evidence were certainly bones that didn't look like there were two eye sockets anymore. And they were giants. All right, this all comes from the story of Odysseus, his adventures where he went to the island of Sicily, and he saw these enormous bones and thought these were giants. We're looking at bones like this, okay? You see the guy holding that bone? See how big it is? This is the human equivalent, okay? This is a lot smaller. So they were seeing giant versions of this, giant versions of all the different bones. In the picture up there, you can see this giant bone. See the giant bone over here, 90 centimeters long? Here's the human bone. It's been magnified about three times to fit you know, I blew it up so it was edge to edge the same size. But this is a lot smaller. They would only come up to maybe right about here on this. So this, these were giant bones. And when they looked at the vertebra, they saw big, big vertebra, big back bones, big ribs, lots of really, really big bones. They didn't know how to explain this. <clears throat> they put them all together, but they didn't really understand. They basically put them together as if it was a human walking like this. And then stood the human up. You stand this up, and now this thing, this giant, becomes huge. What they were really seeing were the bones of a forest or dwarf elephant that used to live on that island but then went extinct. So only, they, they saw only bones. They never actually saw these animals living there. But this, this face, look at this face. It looks like it has a chin with teeth or the angle of the jaw. Here's the face, there's the eyes in front looking out. It certainly looks a lot like a big head of a human with really, really big arms and legs. So when you compare the human skull to the skulls they were seeing, look, look at these big teeth. Our teeth are kind of small, and each one is separated. These teeth are actually fused together. Let me show you what an elephant-like tooth looks like. I have here a fossil tooth from a relative of an elephant. The relative is a mastodon. This is a tooth, one tooth. Look at the size of this tooth. This is heavy, this is a hell of a paperweight, okay? I take this, it becomes my entire carry-on package on the plane because it's so heavy. So this tooth, if you saw a bunch of these, it would look like they could grind, like a grist mill. They had these, you know, these surfaces on here where they could grind. And you've heard of stories of giants that would grind your bones to dust, right? If you imagine that those teeth were grinding human bones, clearly this giant with teeth like that, each tooth being huge like that, could grind your bones to dust. So a lot of that story of the giant could have been from seeing these elephant-like teeth. But what about the cyclops part of the skull? So if you look at the human skull, you've got two eye sockets. You look at this skull, you've got one eye socket. That certainly looks like you're looking at a cyclops now. Right? One eye in the middle of the skull. Except in reality, that eye on the elephant is over here on the side. But that doesn't look like an eye socket, right? It's not closed up like ours is. All right, so I want you to imagine, here's, here's a picture of an actual dwarf elephant that's from a different island. They still uh, exist now, but not on that island anymore. Here's a dwarf elephant. And let's take a look at what it would look like if we put that elephant skin on top of the skull. Okay, we do it very slowly. I want you to keep your focus right over here. Actually, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put this arrow right here. Okay, so this is approximately where the eye is gonna be, okay? Get that. There's the eye. What's over the hole where the cyclops is? Let me go back one. We'll try it again. Ready? Keep track of that hole now. What's over the hole where the cyclops eye was? The nostrils. This is where the elephant's trunk air tubes go into the head. That's the breathing hole of the skull. It's simply the nose hole. But because it was front and center, they thought it was a cyclops. But cyclopia actually really does exist. There are animals born with one eye socket because they have a malformation of the middle of their face, the front. And so this is actually a taxidermy uh, fetal goat with one eye in the front here. This is a head of a calf, a baby cow, with, with two eyes but in one socket. And if you think that isn't real, here's some real live animals. This is a baby sheep. Okay, a little lamb with, with one eye socket. This is a baby goat with one eye. This, it's cute, isn't it? 
That's a kitten. This is a kitten with one eye. So it really does happen. It's a real deformity that does happen. So they knew about cyclopia because they had a lot of inbred sheep and goats. So they'd seen it before. And by the way, it could happen to humans too. I'm just not showing you the pictures of the humans that have this deformity. But it does happen in humans too. Okay, let's go on to an animal you guys really know, the longhorn. Okay, so here's our longhorn steer, except he's riding on the subway in New York City. Why? Because he's part human. This is the minotaur, half human, half bull. This story actually is an ancient Greek story. The minotaur was the child of the Cretan queen, queen of Crete. Her name was Pasiphae, and Pasiphae had an affair with a majestic <laughs> white bull. That's all I'm gonna say about that. And this is what happened. This is supposed to be a moral story against bestiality. But here is the bull's head on a baby, on a well, very big baby, but a child's body. This is the queen. And here's the minotaur, the baby minotaur. Well, this minotaur was rumored to be so beastly that it ate other people. So they locked it into a labyrinth. And this is a coin that shows some of the labyrinth, the maze that was designed by Daedalus. And they fed it tributes of young people, young men and women, were sent into the maze and they never came back out again. And supposedly the Minotaur ate them. Maybe they got lost in the maze, maybe they snuck out. We don't know. But we know that they were sent into the maze and the story is that the Minotaur ate them. So Theseus decided he was going to put an end to this. No more killing young people. He went in and he killed the Minotaur. And here are two depictions on mazes. One where he's got it grabbed by the nose here. Here's the eyes, here's the ears, here's the horns of the Minotaur. Here's another Minotaur, a different depiction. It has only one horn and a much shorter face. And this might actually be a little closer to the truth of what the Minotaur really might have looked like. Okay? So in addition to this being half human, half bull, remember this is a society of people that really worship bulls. They had really big bulls at the time that were used for sacrifices called aurochs. Here's someone holding just the top part of the skull, this part right over here, of an auroch. You can see how huge these skulls and this animal was massively big. It was like a dinosaur-sized cow or bull. Okay, with big horns here. Here's an auroch. Here's modern cattle. This is the bull. Here is the cow. Here's modern cow. Here's the skeleton of one. So they really existed, and their skulls were found in the palace at Knossos, where that queen supposedly lived in Crete, where the labyrinth was. But could real horns appear on a person? I mean, I know there's a comic character down here. His name is Hellboy. You may have heard of him, right? Hellboy? Yes. Who's heard of Hell Hellboy? A few of you, okay. So here's Hellboy. Usually you see him with his horns sawed off because he's trying to be good. But here's what he's supposed to look like with his horns grown out. There are even been sculptures of people with horns, but they were mistaken identities. A sculpture of Moses with two horns. And, and that led to a rumor that Jews had horns sticking out of their heads. Jews don't. Okay. This, these horns were actually a literal translation of horns of light. It was illuminated. It had light coming out of it. And they described the light rays. Rays was translated badly as horns. And Michelangelo literally drew horns on the head. But what could this inspiration really have come from? Well, there are real people who have cortified growths coming out of their skin. It's like little tumors in the skin. And these cortified growths look like horns. Sometimes they're little, sometimes they're big. Sometimes they're sticking out the side like, like bull horns. Sometimes they're curly. They can be really big. They can really look like goat or cow horns. Look at that one. Or even that one. Here's one that's actually coming out of someone's chest from a burn. And after the burn, the skin grew weird and made a horn over there. So these things really did happen. They really did exist. And so it is kind of grounded in reality. Speaking of horns, let's talk about the unicorn. So while our minotaur might have been some poor person with a pathology coming out of their head, unicorns were essentially a goat with one horn. I know we like to imagine them as white horses, but the original unicorns had a beard and they had cloven hoofs. See that? They had cloven hoofs. They were actually a goat. But the mythology of the unicorn is very interesting. The mythology is that this horn was magical. 
And if the unicorn found poisoned water, it could dip its horn in the water and turn it into fresh drinking water. So that was pretty powerful. So unicorns were in high demand, especially by royalty, because they wanted to make sure if anything was touched you know, by, by poison, they could purify it before they you know, would drink it. So they would want to have a unicorn or horn around so they could use it to purify any, any poisons that someone might give them. <coughs> but what was the real unicorn? Maybe the real unicorn was actually inspired by a rhino, which has a horn sticking up. Marco Polo described these animals as scarcely smaller than elephants. They have feet like an elephant's, a single large black horn in the middle of the forehead, a head like a wild boar's. They spend their time, by preference, wallowing in mud and slime. They're very ugly brutes to look at. They are not at all as we describe them. So he looked at this and said, that's a unicorn? That doesn't look at all like what we thought unicorns were. Well, he was probably seeing a rhino. But more likely, this could have been the inspiration of the unicorn. This is actually an oryx, an African animal that is very goat-like, usually whitish in color, can have some black markings. And it has two horns. If you look very carefully, there are two horns. Two horns, see the two points right there. There are actually two horns, side by side. They're very close together, they're very evenly matched, and when you see the animal profile, it looks like one horn. And so they may have thought this was a unicorn. Look, it even has the ribbing on the horn. See the little ribbing on the horn here? So this may have been the inspiration of the unicorn. But there's another animal that may have been the inspiration, and that's the narwhal, which has this long, twisty-like horn. Let me show you a narwhal horn. This is actually a replica of a narwhal horn. You saw this? This would be one heck of a unicorn horn, right? I don't need the document camera for this. I think it's big enough, right? But if this is not a horn. This is actually a tooth. It comes out of the mouth. This is a tusk, like an elephant tusk. So these whales only have one tooth, and it only erupts in the male. It's a really interesting tooth. It may have some magical powers in the sense that this tooth can sense salinity in the water, and it can sense temperature, and it helps the whales navigate in and out between the icebergs, you know which way is open ocean, and which way is deeper into where the, the fresh water is melting off of the glaciers and the icebergs. But this horn was in high demand. Now remember the mythology of the unicorn. If the unicorn dipped its horn into sour water, it could turn it into sweet water. If it found poison water, it could turn it into drinking water. But if it couldn't, it was destined to lose its horn. The magic would fail and the horn would fall off. So where would you find unicorn horns? At the edge of the ocean. Because the ocean was too powerful for any unicorn to be able to convert it all into sweet water. Therefore, traders coming back from Greenland brought unicorn horns. At least they passed them off as such, because they got a lot of money for them. And said, we found it at the edge of the ocean. Well, they weren't lying. The narwhals were slaughtered at the edge of the ocean by the Greenlanders, and they bought the horns off of them, which are really tusks. And they brought them back to Europe and said, proof, unicorns exist. Here they are. Here's the proof. Who wouldn't want one of these? Royalty paid big money for this. Queen Elizabeth I paid as much as it cost to buy a whole castle to get one of these. The thought was, she could dip it into any water that someone gave her and make sure that it wasn't poison. Of course, we know if the unicorn's magic didn't work, it fell off. <laughs> it's probably not going to work there either. But she didn't know that. So this is the unicorn horn. It's really probably a narwhal tusk. That was the evidence, the proof of unicorns, although the inspirational animal might really have been an oryx. Let's talk about werewolves now. OK, werewolves. So werewolves could have been inspired by something called cynocephaly. These were dog-headed humans. And we don't really understand what these dog-headed humans were, but there were lots of pictures and lots of descriptions, even Egyptian gods with dog heads, jackal-headed god. But there were lots of pictures of, of whole races of people with dog heads. Some of them were, were tending herds of sheep, and some of them were religious figures over here. <clears throat> some of them were storytellers. They had all walks of life that regular people had, but they had dog heads. Where could that have come from? It could have come from Vikings and other warriors, there's a samurai, that wore wolf skins over their heads to channel the spirit of the wolf in war. 
And therefore, and these, these were called the berserkers, the Viking berserkers. There were the regular Viking warriors, and then there were the berserkers, which were crazy, which is where we get the word going berserk, going crazy. Um, they were the, the tougher warriors that would run out ahead, and they wore wolf skins. And so it could have been that people were seeing people wearing wolf skins. It could also be stories of people coming back from foreign lands like Africa, coming back to Europe, not understanding that they were looking at people who had manipulated their faces because of various tribal uh, rites of passage. Uh, and not only from Africa, but places like New Guinea and so on. You get people who do lots of modifications to their face to make it look like they have a longer face. And that longness of the face could have been interpreted by people who didn't understand what they were seeing as if the people had snouts or muzzles like a dog would have, or big, long, fang-like teeth like a dog might have. They look like, like fangs over here. But what they might have really seen was a real animal that did exist in Africa that was kind of half dog-like and half human-like in its appearance. That animal is the baboon. This is the skull of a baboon. Can you all see that from where you are? People in the back, can you see it? Can't really say. We're going to try the document camera one more time, and we'll see if it works. If it doesn't work, well, it doesn't work. We'll ho hopefully, it'll toggle back and forth. Let's see if we can do that. Okay, as promised, here is that snake. See those long teeth in here? Now imagine ramping that up to something that had teeth that looked a little bit like this claw in size, giant teeth. So they knew what snakes looked like back then when they were dinosaurs. They didn't understand that they thought they were really big snakes and said they were dragons. Now let's look at these. Okay, here's a baboon. Let's back that out a little bit. Oh, now the document camera doesn't want to back things out. Okay, well, this baboon has what looks like the muzzle of a dog, but the head of a human. It's got a big round skull. It's got forward-facing eyes. See that? Here's the forward-facing eyes. Shut up the light on this for a minute. Maybe it'll look better. A little harder to see, but you, you see the forward-facing eyes there. A little too white it out. And let's compare that to an actual wolf skull. So they might have seen a wolf. <coughs> might have actually seen a bear too, because bears can walk upright on two legs for quite a bit. And so if they saw a bear, they might think that that was a dog-headed human because it's walking on two legs. This is a bear. See the front of its face is a lot like a baboon. It's got these very long teeth over here, like that, that look kind of like these long canines over here. What about a wolf? Let's take a look at a wolf skull. Let's see how close that is to the baboon. Here's the wolf skull. Look at these teeth. In fact, I think the baboon's teeth are a little bit scarier than the wolf. Look at that. Here's the baboon, here's the wolf. So this part from here forward looked like a wolf, from here back, it didn't look like a wolf. We'll saw these pointy parts on the back of their head. See that right there? It's a pointy part. Whereas if you look at the back of a baboon's head, it's much rounder. It's a lot more like a human with this roundness on the back of the head. Okay, let's hope this works. I'm going to try and go back. Yes, it worked. All right. Okay. The other thing that they saw was eye shine. So in the dark, if you have eye shine, shining back at you, you might think that was something channeling some special spirits and energy. These are wolves at night, and you can see their eyes are, are reflected. What happened? Go back. I didn't do it. Go back. Oh, just keep going. Okay, it'll, it'll get fixed. Okay, here's a dog. If you shine a light in a dog's eye, this is what the back of their eye looks like. It has a reflective surface. It's metallic light, and it will reflect the light right back at you. You get that, that eerie glow. When you do that with a human, well, we can't see it because the magnification changed. But you've seen that phenomenon of red eye when you take a flash picture of people in the dark because their eyes are so dilated you're seeing right to the back of their eye and the flash goes back there and reflects back out. Well, humans have red eyes at night. There we go, red eyes, here we go. And the red eye flash is what gave rise to the idea that, that humans could be werewolves because werewolves were rumored to have red eye shine at night, unlike the dogs, which have green. And so that red is simply the back of the human eye. We're not used to looking around in the dark like nighttime animals are. And so when you shine a light in someone's eyes, it reflects red instead. We don't have that reflective layer, this shiny surface in the back of our eyes. Also, you become a werewolf by being bitten by a werewolf. Well, there's a disease that's a lot like that called rabies. 
If you get bitten by a dog that's rabid, you become rabid. And what happens is you, your nervous system starts to go crazy and you eventually die. But as you go crazy, you start becoming aggressive, angry. You try biting people and scratching people and biting people and you foam at the mouth. And these are traits that were associated with being a werewolf, acting crazy like that. And then there's a disease of extra hairiness of the body. And people with this disease were actually thought to be werewolves because they had so much hair coming off of their body. They looked like an animal and not like a human. And has anybody here seen The Greatest Showman? So do you remember the dog boy? The dog boy, this is the poster of the dog boy here, the dog-faced boy. And this is another poster from another circus. This is dog-faced man, I guess he got older. And this is, this is him in reality. This is what he really looked like. This is not a poster, this is a real photograph. This is a woman with the same syndrome, a poster of her. And there's hair coming off of their faces. This is a real syndrome. People today exist that still have this syndrome. And it's basically associated with you know, being a werewolf in those days because we didn't understand that it's a pathology of extra hair growth. There's another syndrome that is, involves sun sensitivity. So people who are sensitive to the sun, their skin can actually become very painful and burn and blister. So they only go out at night. And when would you go out in the medieval times? When there's a full moon. Because there's no street lamps. So you need a full moon to see what you're doing. So again, this was associated with werewolf behavior, traveling outside at night only on a full moon, having hairiness, acting crazy, all of that probably led to werewolf. Now what about vampires? Okay, y'all think of Dracula, right? Well, I wanna investigate the animal side of this mythology, okay? So we think about the animal side, it's this man turning into a bat. What's the real inspiration between you know, the man and the bat is the vampire bat. This is a vampire bat. It is actually drinking blood from the neck of this goat. This is the face of a vampire bat. Look at these long teeth. These are the teeth that people associate with being a vampire. The hollow teeth are which blood is being sucked. Well, the truth is their teeth are not hollow. If you look at a vampire skull, they're not hollow. They're actually very sharp though, these very sharp teeth. And I've got a vampire skull here to show you. I might wait till the very end to show you that because I'm a little afraid that the document camera won't work. So I'm gonna save it to the end and I'll show you at the very end in case it doesn't flip back. But I'm gonna show you a vampire skull. There's two more skulls I wanna show, so let me bring them over now so I can. Okay, there we go. So these teeth were used for cutting the skin. And these teeth here, these ones on the front right here, were used for puncturing into a blood vessel. And then the blood vessel would leak and they would simply, I don't know if you can see it there, it's maybe too much light here, but there's a long tongue over here and it's licking the blood out from the wound. This is the face of the vampire bat. This is the skin of the goat. And here's its tongue licking the blood from the wound. So they don't drink it through hollow teeth. Who has hollow teeth? Snakes, snakes do, with venom. Bats do not, mammals do not have hollow teeth. So a vampire bat does not have hollow teeth. But this idea of drinking the blood is what gave rise to this idea of someone sucking blood out of the body. How about the chupacabra? Now here's an animal close to home for you guys, right? Who's heard of the chupacabra? All right, who's seen a chupacabra? I've seen one with grandma. Seen one, you've seen it, okay. Too. All right, let's talk about chupacabra. <clears throat> chupacabra means goat sucker. And this goat sucker is an animal that is basically a cross between a werewolf and a vampire. So you got a wolf-like animal that drinks blood like a vampire. That's the idea. So here it's shown as having two teeth that puncture into the goat and it's gonna drink the blood through the teeth into this wolf-like animal with his dinosaur spine sticking out of its back with, with leather-like skin and big claws. Nighttime animal, scary animal. Here's the real thing. Here's what people are seeing. There's one looking at you. There's another one over here. There's another one. Look how skinny this animal is. You can see its ribs showing. You can see little bumps on its back where its spine is starting to show through over here. They were considered fierce but not really big, kind of dog-sized. Red eyes and large fangs, walking on two legs or four. 
lizard-like skin or sparse fur, and pronounced backbones or sharp spines. They might have seen something like this. This animal looks like it's got sharp spines sticking out of its back. This is fur. This is not very much fur, so it's lost most of its fur here, has some fur over here. This is a coyote, and those other pictures were coyotes and raccoons that had severe mange. So when people found chupacabras, dead ones, they were able to really examine them and see exactly what they were, took a good look at the skulls, and what we saw are these long, fang-like teeth, but they're not hollow, no blood being sucked through it. This is the face of a coyote, this is the face of a raccoon, but these animals had lost all of their fur. This is a raccoon. This is, I don't know why this picture's not showing up as well as what I have. I, there's, oh, it's off the screen. His head is turned back like this. This is a coyote. There's its face over here. This is another one. The head is off the screen. That's a coyote. This is a coyote. This is a coyote. These are essentially coyotes or raccoons. So let's take a look at a coyote. This is a coyote. Looks a lot like a dog, doesn't it? It has the same fangs like a dog. See those fangs there? Those canines? This is a raccoon. A lot smaller, but it also has those same fang-like teeth here sticking out. So it's these fang-like teeth that were thought to have punctured into the goat and made the holes that they drank blood from. But in fact, these animals probably were just attacking the goat so they could have some dinner. They weren't necessarily drinking out of those holes, you know, through hollow teeth. But these animals were very mangy, so they looked skinny, they were sick, their bones were sticking out, so it looked like they had spines, and it looked like they had leathery skin. And of course, if you shine a flashlight on, you get that eye shine coming back, which looks a little bit reddish on these animals. Now here's the other animal I promised to show you. I want to show you some bat. This is a fruit bat which is one of the bigger bats. This one over here is a vampire bat. It's a tiny little bat. Look how, look how little that skull is. Let me put it in the center one. That's a vampire bat. Here's its lower jaw, right over here. Compare that to the fruit bat over here, right? Let's, let's see if this document camera can zoom in. No. Yes, there we go. Now it's working really want to zoom in. The light may not be bright enough on here. I'm going to turn this off and see if the ambient light's better. No, yeah, no light. Okay. So we'll go back to this light. Back it out just a little bit so we get a little bit more light on there. Okay. So look carefully. And right over here, you see these teeth? I can't quite with that. That's not looking. <laughs> I'm going to use this claw. This will show up. Aha. There we go. See what I'm pointing at right there? Those are the sharp teeth of the vampire bat. That's what it uses for cutting. And in the very front, right up here, you see them at the very top there? Those are the teeth it uses for puncturing right inside the vessel and making the blood come out of the vessel. So that's vampire bat. Okay, so we've had a full tour of lots of different animals. I hope you guys have enjoyed this uh, session, and I don't know if there's time for any questions, but if there are, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, everyone. Divide the mouth into quadrants. So we divide it right down the midline here into left and right sides, and then we divide it into upper and lower jaw. This is on a spring, so I can't take it off. Okay? And we just count the teeth in one quadrant of the face. 
The formula for teeth for an adult human is two incisors. I'm going to count them. One, two, one canine. This is the tooth that in some people is very long and looks vampire-like. Two premolars. One, two. And then we have three very interesting molars. The first one erupts when you're around six years old. So that's the six-year molar. So someone has that, they've achieved at least six years of age. The second one erupts at around 12 years old. If you have that, you've achieved 12 years of age. And the third one, which is not erupted on this skull, comes out at around 18 years of age. So most of you are right at the point that the skull is at right around the point where the wisdom tooth is about to come out. And it comes out plus or minus a year or two from 18 years old. So usually at the end of high school or the very beginning of college is when people go and have their wisdom teeth taken out. Now maybe the skull, they had taken the wisdom teeth out, but this is, this is cast from a much older, not old person, but a long time ago skull. So back then they didn't take wisdom teeth out. So this was probably a person who died before reaching their 18th birthday. So maybe about the same age as you guys. But let's take a look at some other skulls. I'm going to bring some of these over. It's a very delicate skull, so I'm going to hold it on this towel. I don't want it to break. This is a real skull. Remember, the other one I showed you was, was actually a plastic replica cast from a real skull. And this one actually is a real skull. I can saturate it here. Hopefully you can see teeth on this skull. Okay, no, it's it's upside down too, but I think you can still see it. Okay, so we've got move it up a little bit more. Okay, there we go. So now we're looking at the teeth on the skull. Everybody see that? We've got the incisors in the middle. So this is this is the midline of the skull right over here. That. And we're going to count teeth in one quadrant, okay? Two incisors, one canine, two premolars, six-year molar, 12-year molar, we're missing a molar. But there's some crunchiness in the bone here, I don't know if you can see it, that looks like some damage was done. So maybe this person had an infected tooth and it fell out. So just to be sure, we have to count the other parts of the skull, because maybe we're looking at a side with some disease. And in this case, I think we are. So let's count the other side. Two incisors, one canine, two premolars, six-year molar, 12-year molar, 18-year molar. This person achieved at least 18 years of age. And you can double check it looking at the lower jaw as well. Two incisors. Oops, it didn't break exactly the middle. The middle is right there. So this, this is the middle. So that's the first and second incisor. This is a canine. Two premolars, six-year molar, 12-year molar, 18-year molar. And if we put the other side of that skull, the jaw together, this is the mandible or lower jaw, put it like that. We can now count the other side. Let me bring this up here, this one's over. So it's, it's fractured here, but we have to count this incisor. Two incisors, one canine, two premolars, six-year molar, 12-year molar, and the last one back here, 18-year molar. So we know this person reached at least 18 years of age, but we can also look at the flatness of the teeth. And these teeth are extremely flat. If I hold it up like this, hopefully you can see just how flat those teeth are. Look at how flat they are, right where it's overlapping the dark background. Those teeth have been worn very, very far down which means that this person's way over 18 years old because they wore their teeth down. Now, either they wore down over time or they wore down more quickly because the person's diet. How many people here are vegetarian? One, two, three. Oh, now they're coming out of the woodworks. Four, five, six, seven. All right, there's a few of you. Eight. No, I. Oh, there's one. Yeah, you're getting braver, right? Okay. So, so some of you are vegetarians. Do you know you're going to wear your teeth down before everybody else? Because vegetarians eat an all-fiber diet, and teeth wear faster when they are grinding fiber than they do when they are slicing meat.
So people on an all-vegetarian diet tend to get smoother, flatter teeth earlier in life compared to people who are on an all-meat diet. And so you can tell based on the time period in the skull, if you know their diet, how old they are based on what you think their diet might have been. And you can adjust for whether they wore their teeth down prematurely or not. Let me show you another skull. Take this one back. Bring another one over. Okay, here is the skull. It's very dark, so maybe very hard to see. This is, I'm going to bring over that white towel because I think it'll be easier to see over the white surface. So these skulls have a darker color to them because they were dug out of the ground and then they were donated. So they were they're used for research study. And these skulls have picked up the color of the, of the earth around them, the darkness of the, of the earth. That's why they're not bleached white like the other skulls you might see. They're the actual natural color. You know, bone is actually dark. Why is bone dark? Because it has marrow in it. If you want to make it white and pretty like these, you have to actually take all the marrow out and bleach it out. So bone is really a marrow storehouse. That's where you make your blood. So it has a darker color because that's where blood is being made. And there's fats in there, oils in there as well. Uh, lots of mineral storage in the skeleton. Lots of things skeletons do besides just be a frame for the body. This is a person who lost all of their teeth. You see that? There's no teeth here. I'm going to turn it a little bit so we can see some of the shape of the front of the head there. But there's actually no teeth. Look at this jaw. There are no teeth in this jaw. So around my feet around here, there's no teeth in this jaw at all. There's no teeth up here in the upper jaw either. There's no teeth here. So what happens to someone when they don't have teeth? The bone starts to resorb, it starts to go away because there's no longer stress forces placed on that bone to make it strong. Bone is actually a very responsive material of the body. When you see it at any one point in time, it seems very static, it's very hard, it's very stiff, it's not changing. But if you did a time lapse of bone, it's much more fluid, it's much more like water in the sense that things move around. And if you have or had orthodontics done? Nobody? Raise your hand if you ever had braces. Oh, that's better, okay. All right, so you know that when you have braces or you've seen someone with braces, you know that there's rubber bands and metal and it's pulling on the teeth and it's pulling them into positions they should be in rather than positions that they were in that they shouldn't be in. As the tooth is being pulled, it puts pressure on the bone in front of the tooth. And as it puts pressure on the bone in front of the tooth, it resorbs that bone away and it reforms the bone behind the tooth. And that allows the tooth to move fluidly through the bone. And as it moves through the bone, if you did a time lapse, it would look like a cork floating in water. And you can move a tooth all the way from one side of the jaw to the other, just by pressure. Because over time, bone is very dynamic, it's changing. Well, if you take away the forces that keep bone strong, it just goes away, it starts to deteriorate. If you're very strong and you build a big muscle, bone actually responds to your big muscles by making more bones, so there's more surface area for the muscles to attach to. If you stop using your muscles, the bone gets weaker, and it actually resorbs, it goes away. So someone who's bedridden, not moving, their bones get very small. Someone who has no teeth, look what happened to this jaw. It got much smaller, the distance from here to here on the jaw, from this point to this point, is tiny compared to the big jaws that we saw before that had teeth in it. This is actually a very narrow, small jaw, and eventually it's going to become a tiny little bar if this person were to live longer, because there's no stress forces placed on it. Okay, let me show you some pathologies that are interesting. Remember when I was showing you the vertebra before? Well, that first vertebra called Atlas, that holds the world up. This bone here, right here, see this bone right here, is Atlas. And this is at the base of a skull. 
So if we look into the skull, I'm not sure there's enough light here to see it. I'm trying to, I'm hoping you can see it. There it is. This is the hole where the spinal cord comes out at the base of the skull. But this is Atlas, the first cervical vertebra. It has been fused to the skull. I can just about get my finger underneath it right there. See, the, see my finger showing up underneath? That bone is stuck to the skull on the side right over here. And so even though it's a separate bone, it should be flexible. This person could not do the yes movement because this bone was fused to the skull. That's a pathology. That's really bad pathology. How about, remember the flexibility of the spine we were talking about? Here is a spine that's curved. Can you see that curvature on the spine? Look at that. It's curving off to, I'm going to keep turning it so you can see all the sides of it. It's bent off to one side. Like that, it's twisted. This is called scoliosis. And when you go to school, sometimes when you go to the nurse's office and they ask you to bend over and they run their fingers down your back, they're checking to see if your spine is straight. Because if it's not, you could fix it before this happens. And you can make it straight again. Because if you don't, it'll end up fused like this and curved, permanently curved in this weird position. So the person is twisted like this and they end up with a hunchback for the rest of their life. That can be avoided, that can be straightened out nowadays. But this is someone who didn't have that benefit, and so their spine is all fused and twisted in one direction like that. Okay, so we've had a chance to look at those. There's one last thing I want to show you. One last thing on the table that I didn't get to. Actually, two last things. Okay. This is a skull from a very small dinosaur. But you can imagine if we ramp up from the lower jaw from the python here. If you saw a python, and then you saw this, you think this is a really big python, right? And then you go from here to a T-Rex, you end up with a giant dinosaur. Okay, so I want you to just make sure you saw that model. That's a really cool uh, velociraptor skull. Last thing I want to show you. These are hip bones, and we use hip bones to determine somebody's sex, if they're male or female. So here are the hip bones. Let's see if I can dial this out anymore. Nope, that's as far as it goes. Okay. So here are two hip bones. If these two hip bones are very narrow and close together like that, it's a male. But if they're wide apart like this, so that this V shape here is very wide, this is from a male, but I'm putting it in the female position. I'm opening up more than it should be. The female has a much wider opening here to have a wide birth canal for the birth of a baby's head to come out of the pelvis. What is this? This is, this is a pelvis, okay? So this pelvis has a ball and socket joint. Unlike the joint we saw before in the humerus when you tried to lift your arm and it was hard to lift it up, this joint is much more restricted because it's really capping the top. It's a ball and socket. So it holds very tight inside there. It allows the flexibility of the rolling motion, but it doesn't allow you to take this, this bone and go way up like this. Unless you disarticulate it. Right? If you have loose ligaments and you're a contortionist, you can, you can do that. But most people can't do that. There's a limit to how much you can swing based on the ligaments that are around that area. But it's much more stable. This allows you to walk. What is the position of the pelvis that allows you to walk? It's my favorite way to, to remember how a pelvis works. You put the pelvis on like this. And now, now I'm a hipster. See? That hips on my head. Oh. So if, if you imagine that for now, the eyes should actually face the ground. And that is the true position of a pelvis. It's actually like that. It's a remnant from when we were walking on four legs. And of course, you need. You need the back part of the, of the mask here. That goes in the back here, right? In the back here. Stick it on here. This together makes the whole pelvis, and it leaves an opening facing backwards. So at, even though we're standing up, our pelvis is still in the position as if we were a four-legged animal. The opening is actually towards the back. And then we curve with that lumbar spine that we were talking about before that allows us to curve backward. That allows us to stand upright. I can leave my pelvis exactly as it is and uncurve that spine and become a four-legged animal. So my pelvis is still in the same position as a four-legged animal. It's the spine that allows you to make it stand upright like that. 
So I hope you had fun with that. Now I think maybe I have time for questions. Thank you. Yes, you noticed that I didn't get to everything. This is a skull of a beluga whale. <laughs> Those are pieces of popcorn bowl. They're not bowls. Don't worry about it. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, that was just part of the padding for the box. But thank you. So this is, these are not teeth that fell on the time. Don't worry. This, these are the teeth of the beluga whale. The beluga whale has a relatively short head compared to dolphins. If you've ever seen a beluga whale in a, in a captive environment, like an aquarium, you might notice they have a very short-looking face to them. Dolphins have much longer snouts on them. And we brought this one kind of to show you what a narwhal's head looks like, except we couldn't get a narwhal's head. They didn't have any narwhal skulls available. But if you imagine this, instead of these teeth, imagine this coming out of the front of the animal's head like that. That is essentially what a narwhal would look like. With essentially that. It's a tooth coming out from the front of the skull. So that's this. This is a narwhal. Uh, excuse me, this is not a narwhal. This is a beluga whale. Narwhal is an even shorter front of its face. No teeth on here, just one long tooth. Other questions? Yes? How can you tell which bones are a mammal? How can I tell which bones are? A mammal's bones. That's a really good question. It depends on a lot of things. So some of it has to do with um, understanding the, the whole gestalt of what the animal looks like. Uh, looking at, at features of the skull, I think, are the most reliable. Because in mammals, there's only one jaw. Just one. Whereas in reptiles, there's more bones to the jaw. So if you look at the back jaw of this alligator, for example, this bone that holds the teeth is called the dentary, and it's the equivalent to our jaw. These bones back here, we don't have in our jaw. These bones, are, there's actually little cracks in here which you can't see probably from where you are, but there's little cracks that separate these off. These bones actually move backward in mammals and become the inner ear bones, the ossicles. So in a reptile, they only have one bone called the columella, which is attached to the skin on the outside of their head and they feel vibrations through that. That skin on the outside of the head becomes the eardrum in humans. It moves inward. And that polymella is still there, and it becomes the stapes or stirrup bone. But we add two more bones. By having extra bones in there, we can actually conduct the sound more efficiently, and, and we can you know, temper it a little bit you know, by using muscles to pull on it and dampen it. So when there's a really loud sound, we can dampen it. And so we can, we can play with it a little bit and adjust the sounds by having more positions in there that, that are movable. And we do that by taking the back end of the jaw and moving it into the ear. So it's a great question, but it's one I think the most reliable is looking at the jaw, but there are other features as well. Yes, right in front of the red. Why was I using gloves? In the beginning, I used gloves only for the snake for two reasons. One is the snake came out of a jar of preservative, and I didn't want to touch the fluid. And second, there's still venom in that snake. And if I accidentally touched the tooth, I did not want to become the first person bitten by a dead snake that needed antibiotics. <laughs> I don't, I didn't use gloves for the human skulls. I don't need to. There, there's nothing contagious on them that I could catch. They've been prepared, they're, they're clean. They're, they're dirt looking only because they were in the dirt, so they picked up the color of the tannins and the leaves and all the things in the dirt. But there's nothing contaminated on those brown skulls that I would need gloves for. If I were dissecting a full human body, as I do over at the medical school, then I use gloves because the human body has preservative in it and the chemicals that are used with the preservative can be irritating to the skin. I don't need them to keep from getting an infection because the infections have all been killed by the preserving solution. But the preserving solution itself is an irritant. It can make your fingers go numb if you touch it for a long time. Yes? Say the question louder. When did I realize that I wanted to pursue my career? That is a great question. Uh, it, it actually makes a very long answer, which I won't give. I'll give the short version of it. Um, I've, I've always been interested, 
I, I, I see you waving your hand. I'll get you next, okay? I've always been interested in animals. I knew I wanted to do something with animals. I'm also an artist, so I like things that are very visual. So I wanted to make sure that I was in a career where I could use my art talent as well. And uh, I didn't know that, that you could make a career of this originally. So I thought about becoming a veterinarian where I, I could work with animals. And I thought that would be the career I wanted. But as I learned more about being a veterinarian, I was less interested in just mixing and matching between disease and diagnosis and treatment. I wanted to be more of a pioneer, more of an exploratory. And that's when I discovered the, that research was a career where I could ask any question in the world and I got to design the experiment to answer it. It's the most um, flexibility in terms of that, most creativity. Um, and in the field of anatomy, everything is visual, it's all pictures. So I, I realized I like the pictures and what got me, oh, don't all run out. Oh my God, Anyway, what got me into that was the ability to draw and look at pictures. There was one question back here, I'll tell you what. If you all have something, one 